Hello, everyone. My name is Leo Giebel. I'm a WCS board member and events committee chair. I'm thrilled to introduce our highly accomplished speakers for today's workshop. Welcome to our highly anticipated virtual event, Professional Development Workshop. Jumpstart your sustainability career with transferable skills. Get ready for an electrifying conversation with our amazing panelists. As we kick off today's session, we warmly part welcome participants old and new. Before we start, do you feel motivated to transition to a clean tech or sustainability career? Are you curious about your transferable skills? Do you need help with your transition and how to get started? If so, you're not alone. An increasing number of professionals are entering into green, clean tech and sustainability careers. Although women make up just 26% of the energy workforce, they made up more than half of the net 300,000 energy jobs added in 2022, according to a June 2023 D Department of Energy report, finding that clean energy jobs grew in every state. Today, we have experts joining us to share the green career landscape, desirable transferable skills, their career transition journeys, hiring trends, employer expectations, advice, and best practices to support your transition. Next slide, please. So we're gonna check out the agenda. We'll start with some quick housekeeping items, then move on to the workshop introduction with Powen, WCS corporate sponsor, and STEM Select, our event sponsor. Then we will have our workshop learning experience, and we will have some dedicated time for Q&A from the audience. Your questions and insights are crucial to the success of this event, so please don't hesitate to drop your questions into the chat. Next slide, please. So who are we? WCS is a nonprofit originally funded, found, sorry, originally founded in the San Francisco Bay Area. We are now in 13 countries with a membership base of more than 500 professional women and men. The organization aims to support women in their careers in the clean tech industry. WCS is celebrating its 13th year anniversary, which is impressive considering that we are a nonprofit primarily run by volunteers. So what do we do at WCS? We hold monthly events such as panels like the one you're on now, and in-person social events. We're now a global organization, so do watch out for an event near you. We also hold professional development workshops. You can check out these events on, on the events page for more information on upcoming workshops. Uh, next slide, please. So here's a quick overview of our upcoming events. We have the E-Circle meeting with Shay Kalinske on May 24th, the LA Chapter Cheers Happy Hour on June 4th, the pitch competition on June 7th, a meet and greet, which is for WCS members only, that's on June 14th. And then we have an e-circle meeting with Ella Hazard on June 21st. And next slide, please. So we'll drop the link to register for our events into the chat. And here are our upcoming professional development workshops or PDWs. Uh, in Q3, we have planning and executing on ES an ESG plan on August 9th. And then in Q4, we have uh, accelerating sustainability strategies using artificial intelligence on October 11th. Next slide. Before we start the conversation, here are just some tips for respectful and engaging conversation. Uh, and again, you're probably very familiar with these after three years of Zoom, but just to go over them, please write your full name and turn on your video if you're comfortable doing so. We do love to see your faces. Uh, and WCS volunteers, please add an asterisk next to your name so that folks know that you're volunteering. Out of respect of our speakers, please mute yourself during the call. And then we do encourage you to add your LinkedIn profile to the chat and connect with other attendees. The more you get involved and active during this event, the more you will benefit from it. Next slide. If you're not yet a WCS member, I encourage you sign up. You can scan the QR code to do so and you'll get reimbursed for today's event. Members get exclusive access to WCS Connect, our Slack channel for networking and collaboration, among other things. Feel free to reach out to me or one of the other WCS members on the call if you have any questions about the membership. Next slide. And if your company is interested in becoming a corporate member, here is some information. Um, you can take advantage of the opportunity to elevate your corporate brand and empower your team with WCS corporate membership. Learn and network with industry professionals from around the world. Join us today and take your organization to new heights. Next slide, please. So next, let's welcome our moderator. Pam is the CEO and founder of Green Training Associates, LLC, established in 2009. 
a full service talent de development firm to build green workforces. Pam transforms learning experiences into organizational impact with 35 plus years corporate training and experience. Pam works with clients in private, higher education, and non-private sectors to accelerate business growth and retain talent through training workshops, leadership development, coaching, DEIAB, employee engagement, career paths, and mentoring solutions. Pam builds thriving cultures, helps people achieve their highest potential, and develops organizational bench strength from onboarding through succession planning. <clears throat> Green Training Associates LLC offers their clients business sustainability expertise. They accelerate an ESG growth and integrate, integrate sustainability into your corporate culture and employee performance. GTA supports green workforce initiatives to bring the technology and skills required to accelerate global decarbonization efforts. Pam is also a skilled consult, consulting partner for women in leadership programs dedicated to elevate and empower women leaders. <clears throat> Pam has a prior 24-year corporate training career for global companies, Citigroup, American Express, Lucent, Technologies Bell Labs and Innovations, Medco Health Solutions. Pam has 30 years in global sales training, 24 plus years in technology, and 15 years in sustainability. Pam is also an active volunteer. She's on the Career Dev Board, uh, Development Board Officer, Professional Development Workshops for Women in Clean Tech and Sustainability, the Women in Green Initiative, WSGBC Maine Region, VP Leadership and Talent for NNJ Association for Talent Development. That was a mouthful. Pam comes with obviously a, a world of experience, and I would like to welcome her to the stage. Thanks, Lael, and thanks to everyone here today. We're thrilled to meet you all. This is an, an exceptional workshop we have planned. We've worked for weeks on this to make sure that you have everything you need to jumpstart your sustainability career and your transferable skills. We know the demand is great out there. We have lots of speakers today that are going to roll up our sleeves and engage with you. So we welcome you. I'm thrilled to invite you all to this, ex this exceptional conversation. We're eager to embark on this journey with you toward a more sustainable future. So we change women's lives with our skill building workshops at WCS. These workshops are intended to make sure that you have the tools in your toolbox to be successful. So shortly, I'm going to introduce our sponsors. We have two sponsors today and we have three speakers. So we're gonna have a busy morning. And after the two sp sponsor brief messages, we'll dive into the workshop experience where we're going to explore how you can leverage those existing skills and experiences to kickstart that career. Now, whether you're a recent graduate, a career changer, or simply passionate about making a positive impact in the environment, this workshop is here and designed to provide you with practical insights and actionable steps to get started. So let me give a warm welcome to Greg Rossi, our corporate sponsor for today. Greg is the global head of talent for Powen. Powen revolutionizes the way energy is generated, transmitted, and distributed using battery storage systems. The technology is 100% in service of the renewable energy sector, advancing the next frontier of energy and changing the way we power our daily lives. Greg, let's hear from you. Thank you so much for Powen Energy's sponsorship today. Excellent. Thank you so much, Pam, for the introduction. Really appreciate it. And, and first, I want to thank WCS and, and this team for putting on events like this. It is so great to see this the interest in this field growing and, and so many folks on the call today. So big shout out to the group here. To expand just a little bit more about Powen, just so who we are, at our core, we are a global energy platform provider. So we're really working at advancing that next frontier of energy by ensuring that there's access to clean, resilient, and affordable power. Our product is a fully integrated utility scale technology and services. And we aim to really uh, provide this transition to clean energy sources. And if we do this correctly, we're essentially reshaping the landscape of energy generation for the future. We truly believe that energy storage systems play a crucial role in mitigating the economic and environmental impacts to climate change. So we believe that no energy should be left behind or go to waste. I encourage everyone on the call today to take a look at the Powen career page. 
2024 is a big year for us, and it really marks this global workforce expansion. We're currently a little over 600 employees and contractors worldwide with plans to grow to over 800 by 2025. We are a remote first organization, but we do have roughly 30% of our population based here in the Pacific Northwest, just outside of Portland, Oregon. I would encourage all of you to take a look at the career page. And if there's something out there that, that catches your eye, feel free to reach out to myself, look up any of our talent acquisition recruiters on LinkedIn. And, and please remember, you do not have to be an engineer. So we have positions across all disciplines of the company from finance to legal, to sales, to accounting. Uh, we definitely want to hire everyone that we can. So again, thank you so much for allowing Powen to be a sponsor of this event. And Pam, I'll hand it back over to you. Thanks so much, Greg. And boy, employers are doing a great job. 200 jobs in the next couple of years with Powen. So absolutely, we're delighted to have you be our guest and our corporate sponsor. Allow me to introduce our next event sponsor. Next slide, please. We have STEM Select Recruiting Firm, Allison Lowry. Next slide, Allison, take it away. Tell us about harnessing talent for a greener future. Thanks, everyone. Uh, welcome, and uh, thank you for having me. I'm pleased to be a, a sponsor for this event. Uh, so who are we? Uh, STEM Select is a recruitment firm specifically related to renewable energy and clean tech. We have over 25 years of collective experience in recruitment, specifically in STEM industries across the U.S. and Europe, and we're headquartered in both England and Texas. Uh, we're passionate about solar, BESS, and clean tech, uh, most predominantly, and we also have an additional emphasis on asset management and the O&M industry sectors. We're a small boutique firm that cares about an authentic approach with our clients and candidates and a real human experience. Uh, WISE, if you can go to the next section, please. So WISE, that is our Women in Sustainable Energy Network. Uh, so we're a network that focuses on supporting recruitment drives for women into these focused sectors that I've just mentioned. Uh, we also partner with under other gender diversity aligned networks like WCS uh, to ally with them and support women in this space. We're also piloting uh, a new service offering, and this is a gender diverse candidate search program. This is for clients that have critical hires where they'd like to have more gender diversity in the candidate submission process and equal representation in the candidate talent pool. How can we help you, those of you joining us today? Um, we offer free advice. We've got three slots per week that you can book in for any questions. May they be around uh, resume stroke CV writing, uh, tips on interview prep, on how to job search, anything of that nature. We also have a weekly event called Sustainability Spotlight. And this is a feature slot on our, uh, on our networks where we showcase your profile and capability to our network. This is a free service. Anybody can ask for your details, which we send across to them should they be interested to speak to you. Um, please feel free to reach out to me if you would like to be sponsored on uh, one of these weekly events. Uh, lastly, um, and slightly prematurely, but we are under construction for a database dedicated to women looking to use their transferable skills to find a green job. So what that means, similar to monster.com or Indeed, you would upload your profile onto uh, the site and anybody that has access to that, uh, to that database can look up your transferable skills and reach out to you directly. This is also a free service that we offer at STEM Select. Um, thanks for having me as a sponsor and and, uh, enjoy the event. Thanks so much, Allison. Next slide. Allow me to briefly introduce our speakers for today. Um, I'm the moderator, of course. We have Cassie Layton, VP of Marketing and EV Connect, Leslie Petrie, Clean Tech Marketing Consultant, and Renee Johnstone, Strategic National Accounts Director, Interpro Staffing and Recruiting Firm. So this is our extraordinary panel of executives who have walked the path themselves and with others that you're seeking to do. We're filled with gratitude for their time and dedication to you. And we'll, while we'll have all panelists, we'll be answering your live challenge questions later on today. So you'll hear from each panelist. I'll reintroduce them when we get to that point in the program. And we want to welcome and thank everyone for making today's program possible. Next slide. Let me just introduce the workshop experience briefly. Sustainability, we know, is not just a buzzword. It's a critical imperative for our planet and future generations. And the good news is, regardless of your background or experience, there's transferable skills 
that you can bring to the table, whether it's project management, communication, data analysis, or problem solving, there's a place for you in the sustainability sector. So 15 years ago, I added a green layer to my corporate career, as you heard my bio from Lael earlier. So when I started Green Training Associates, I decided I wanted to create a tidal wave of change to protect the earth. And I want to use everything I know about developing people's capabilities to solve the world's challenges. So I've walked this journey along with two of our guest speakers, Cassie and Leslie, and we're here to help you. And not only did I change corporate careers, but I also started a business. Those are two layers of, of, of change. They're important. And I can acknowledge that, um, you know, the journey that I've gone through and work with you on yours. So throughout the workshop, we're going to help you identify and highlight those transferable skills. You're going to learn a six-step career transition process. You're going to listen to two speakers, um, Cassie and Renee, uh, Leslie, who took the journey successfully. And then you'll hear from Renee about her experience and expertise about what employers are looking for in the hiring conversations. And then you're going to have a breakout session, which you're going to participate with another partner in this workshop. And you're just going to talk about where you are with your career journey. You're going to take that journey map and apply it to yourself. And um, the fireside chat with Renee is going to be fantastic. And then we're going to do a Q&A at the end where we'll take your live challenges. So let's dive into this um, exciting journey and the program. So by the end of the workshop, you're going to have the knowledge and skills. So let's make a tidal wave of change together. So the data science of networking, really important. So if you don't know dice.com, make a note because they're the technology um, recruiting, staffing, you know, uh, thought leader and trends in the hiring sector for tech. So they show that 87 to 92% of jobs are filled through introductions or referrals from your network. So data also shows that being referred increases your chances of landing an offer more quickly and choosing the right employer because you're going to have conversations with your network about the employer. Greg has offered his help. We've heard also help from um, Allison. This is the opportunity. Where do you go? Wh who do you talk to? This is building your network. So finally, we look at referrals as reducing the time to hire by up to 31%. So what that means is that because you're referred in by an employee internal to the organization, it accelerates your application. And, and even better, 50% of referred employees stay in their position for at least three years. That's a critical acknowledgement over the reason why employers sometimes offer a bonus to employees to bring in their network. Next slide. So let's talk about the career transition process and transferable power skills. I call them power skills. So you'll hear about that in a minute. But the career transition is a process. And so what we're going to do is talk about what is the process. Then we're going to go into the transferable skills. And the heartbeat of sustainable development is the interdisciplinary approach of science and technology that helps operate the circular economy, solve problems, innovate, lead change, and drive human awareness, motivation, and a commitment to sustainable technology. So the business case for developing and maximizing your existing transferable skills into your new career is clear. First of all, your technology and technical credentials are not enough. The licenses, certifications, and everything, employers want that, but they also want more from you to be successful. Companies that basically hire people for their IQ, but they fire them for EQ. And when they're missing EQ, that's the reason why they let people go is because you're not tuned into the relationships. So what you do for your job is your is your work experience and expertise, but how you do your job is about the relationships you build. So the skills that I'm going to share with you in a couple of slides from now are about building those, those skills and relationships and the transferable skills reside within us and we can also acquire them. Next slide. Let's jump into the career transition process briefly. So this flow is in the handout. I know, um, Denise, we've got somebody that's going to post a handout in the chat for the participants. Let's pop that into the chat right, right now for them. And we'll also send it out afterwards. So there's six steps in the career transition process from left to right. You're going to frame your career challenge. What's the current state? What's the future state? How do you close that gap is where you are and what you're dreaming of for your career. Then you want to identify those transferable skills where you and also plan to fill the skill gaps and the knowledge gaps that you have. Then you identify the right resources, 
which is you're changing industries possibly, you want to follow new thought leaders, build a new network, or leveraging an existing network. So it's getting the lay of the land outlined at this point in the transition process. You're evaluating where you are, what you need, and how you build that and close those gaps. Then you're crafting and pitching your new story. That's an updated resume or CV. Compare your before and after. Where are you? What are the most important changes you need to make? When you study those job descriptions, you want to look for what that what their employer is asking and what compares to your resume and what you need to fill requirements or qualifications. You're also learning a new language, which is important, green, clean tech, and sustainability industries. So you want to follow thought leaders, attend webinars, study the language, because you want to start learning that language. And then finally, you're going to prepare yourself to transition. That's an emotional and mental change. And, and we want to talk briefly about avoiding imposter syndrome, which I'm going to be speaking about shortly in this segment, about ne and avoiding negative self-talk. So let's jump to the next slide around these um, transferable skills. Transferable skills are your superpowers. I call them power skills instead of soft skills. Well, what are they? They're a set of capabilities that develop the power skills that allow you to interact or people skills. They were formerly called soft skills. I think it's misnamed, so I've renamed it. These are all transferable skills that we bring and that you may also want to develop. So I'll invite you, this is in your handout, to study it closely. But this is what I use for my clients when I train technology professionals. I've delivered skill building training curriculum my entire career about this layer of skills on top of technology professional skills. So the business case is clear. Science and technology is changing, innovating. You've got to be a risk taker. You've got to be an innovator. You've got to be a change um, oriented person. And all of these things, um, collaboration, working with cross-disciplinary, cross-functional, cross-organization teams, all of these things are the underpinning of success in a transferable um, skills. So there's also team leaders across the bottom row, because if you want to manage people, there's a set of skills to do that as well. So I'm going to invite you to think about your career transition journey right now. As you look across this list of skills, how many of these skills can you mark yourself as proficient or better? And which ones do you still need to develop? This is in your handout. You're going to have the opportunity to review it. But I want you to start thinking about yourself. These are foundational to any career today. And especially you're going to possibly bring these with you to an employer that's going to be looking for these skills. So I'm going to invite you to reflect on this. This is in your hands out. I'd like to move to the next slide to talk about the imposter syndrome. So imposter syndrome is very common in, in women particularly, and especially high achieving people, when you find it difficult to accept your accomplishments. So outwardly, you're exceptional and you've got a set of accomplishments, but internally, you just don't feel like you're deserving of those accolades. So that makes you feel anxious, not experiencing success internally, despite being high performing. And it often results as feeling like a fraud or a phony where you're doubting yourself and we self-sabotage. So the negative self-talk creeps in. This is a critical time in your career when you're moving into this space as you're jump starting your sustainability career. So if you don't find value in yourself, you may not be communicating that value to your influencers and stakeholders. Next slide. So the antidote, and these slides are in the, the handout for you to, to look over, because I want to get to our two interviews. Um, we've got career journeys coming, and then Renee talking about, uh, about hiring trends. So the imposter syndrome, the antidote, we all start somewhere. You're choosing, you're chosen, you're in the room for a reason. You want to talk with yourself like you, you would talk to your best friend. Reframe negative to positive self-talk, be kind to yourself, give yourself grace, and it's okay to say, I don't know, let me find out. You could deal with it, cry, get over it, move forward, because people are relying on you as a leader, and they're looking to you to not be hiding in your office. So let me invite you to think about whether you have any imposter syndrome, and if it's going to hold you back in the interviews, and the networking, and the referral conversations that you're seeking, these are some suggestions about helping you. So let me jump to the next slide and introduce our spotlight interviews with two leaders who have had successful career transition journeys. Next slide. And let me introduce Cassie Layton, who's a VP of Marketing and EV Connect. We have an extraordinary story that Cassie is going to tell. Let me jump to the next slide, invite um, Cassie to the microphone and tell us your career journey. 
Absolutely. Thank you so much, Pam, for having me and, and to WCS and all the volunteers here today. I'd like to first give a shout out to everyone that joined this this uh, this talk to, to hear from me. I think that you're already taking a big step in your career journey of thinking about what that transition looks like. When I look back on my career, why did I make so many different choices? I took, I would say, a road less traveled. For me, about framing my career change was all about impact, and I wanted to have maximum impact of wherever I was. And so I'm going to go through some of these roles that I had and specifically call out the tactics that I took to make that leap to the next one, because none of this is linear. Um, none of the they're all different industries, different types of customers I worked with, different types of departments, um, very much a road less traveled, but it is possible. Possible, um, and it's possible for you too. So I started my career journey at a small company called FunZone. We acted as an agency for private label brands like Gymboree and Bath and Body Works. I was a little bit of a Jill of all trades in this role. And so um, I wanted to move to a different city when um, I was making that transition to Old Navy. And so I had engaged a talent agency to help me in, in staffing here. And you'll hear a trend of a friend, a talent agency, or even on my own through LinkedIn. So I am part of that statistic of that referral that was uh, addressed earlier on this call. So the way that I was able to land the role at Old Navy was I saw that the hiring manager had looked at my LinkedIn. I had um, uh, LinkedIn premium. You can get it too. You can get it for free as a trial. Highly recommend you use it as a tool. So I saw that the hiring manager looked at my profile I reached out to her, sent her an in-mail and said, I saw you looked at my profile. I'd love to work for you. Here's my resume. Let me tell you a little bit about why I'd be great for working for you. And she loved my initiative. And she thought that I just did a great job of, of reaching out. I got to the interview stage um, and I was able to secure that role. And that was important to have that type of initiative because she adopted a baby. And so I only got to work with her for two weeks before she left and then I was on my own. And so I always think those types of things happen when you take initiative, good things happen. You're taking initiative today, good job and keep it going. So as I move forward in terms of uh, my move from Old Navy to Accenture, where I was a consultant in a B2B space, where my experience was more in the direct-to-consumer space, um, I needed to think about how I could really showcase myself. Nobody knew who FunZone is. Some people knew who Old Navy was. Um, I, I worked with a recruiter with um, Accenture, but that doesn't mean that you get the job, even if a recruiter reaches out to you. You still have to prove yourself. So what I did is I analyzed the job description um, in mass detail, and I basically came up with three to five stories of similar experiences of way that I solved the problem and had a result. And I had those three to five stories memorized. So regardless of what question I got in the interview process, I could quickly pull an example and relate it to that job experience. So if you're not already doing that, highly encourage you to understand the resume at hand to really showcase um, that you have that uh, that bit that acumen um, from the skills and the power skills. So from the move from Accenture to Happy Returns, which was a startup, they were an early stage uh, reverse logistics B to B to C. What I did there is um, I was able to get my foot in the door after applying. But how did I actually get the final job? There were several very competitive candidates. I did something that's a little unconventional and it's something that you might wanna think about. Um, in this particular experience, I brought a 30, 60, 90 day plan if they were to hire me. It's a little aggressive of a move. Um, maybe it uh, also made me come off as a little, I don't know, conceited, like I was gonna get the job, but I did it in a way of, I really want this job and I'm really thinking about how I can make an impact for your company. And I'm listening to you throughout this interview process. This is how I think I can make an impact for you in the first three months. What do you think? And what it did was it planted the seed of what if she was here and how would she do that? And how what's the impact there? And so I've taken some of these um, elements throughout my career to now where I'm at um, at EV Connect, which is in the sustainability space. Um, EV Connect is an EV charging company. I started as a director and I've been promoted. I've been there for four years and um, they were a more late stage EV charging startup. 
And um, this is one I blindly applied to is during the height of COVID. Um, so everybody was looking for a job. Um, and so how could I showcase my knowledge of, of EV charging? I knew nothing about EV charging. None of my experience had really uh, led me there, but I knew that I wanted to make an impact. I knew that I wanted to create a better future. And I think that's probably uh, common for all of you here on this call. So what I did is I set up Google alerts for all the news stories about EV charging. And I read and I read and I read, and I saw that, EV Connect had just gotten an investment from a Japanese company. So I even read stories about what was happening in EV charging in Japan. And I brought it to the interview to say, I've read this article. I've researched your company. What are your thoughts on this? This is what I gathered. And it really just showcased, I took the time to research, to understand, and that I can, I can learn your industry very quickly. And I have all of the other um, power skills that that Pam talked about. And so you always want to showcase some of those power skills. So that's just a quick snapshot in a very short amount of time of some key tactics I took. And then Pam, I know that you have some questions for me since I'm now on the other side where I'm interviewing candidates like some of you on the on the call. Uh, thanks, Cassie. And boy, what an impressive um, career journey. And we love the the visual that allows us to see how you really took all of what you know in your functional expertise, you developed it, you expanded your functional expertise, and then you proved yourself as valuable to EV Connect. And just love this. One of the other interesting things about you, Cassie, is that you are a hiring manager and that you are involved in the process as marketing executive when you're hiring people into EV Connect. So what advice can you give to the career transitioners about from your hiring manager role? So when you put your hiring manager hat on, what advice can you tell these career transitioners that you look for? Absolutely. So I would recommend starting out with what are those power transferable power skills that you have and identify how those transferable power skills are applicable to a specific role and create a story. And there's three that I particularly look for as a hiring manager. And my verbiage is a little different in the handout, but this is how I think about it. So the first one I call is managing the gray. And I would say that almost every career team today lacks a very specific set of instructions of this is what you do every single day. This is who you talk to. I mean, there's just not a playbook. The, the, the industry is changing. The technology is changing. And so what I'm looking for is someone who is adaptable, that there's a problem and I figure out there's not this black and white view. There's a gray and learning how to manage the gray. So if you're able to really tell me a story of I had this problem. I don't think there was really anybody that knew how to do it. So I Googled it. I figured it out. I had, I made a mistake. This is what I learned from it. So think about those experiences. The other two I kind of combine, and that's a growth mindset and grit. Things are hard. Things are difficult. No matter what job you have, you're, and, and even if it's your dream job, I'm in my dream job and there are hard days. There are difficult days. And so if you're able to think about how you grew through any type of challenge and you articulate that, that's what I'm looking for from a transferable power skill, because I want those people on my team that will help in, in, in the development and growth. Great advice. And um, final question, what candidate deal breakers can you share? Mm -hmm. This is a great question. There's a couple that I can think of. So the first is when I'm interviewing, I like to, to ask candidates to tell me a story about a particular experience. Tell me a time that blah, blah, blah. So you should be prepared for that of any interview. Tell me a story. But what I like to do is dissect that story. Like, let me dig in a little bit. And when I'm digging in and a candidate is unable to give me a little bit more information about the story, it tells me that they had a very surface level job about that experience, or they were on a team and somebody else was really driving it. So I like people that are able to say, oh, well, this is what really happened and dig in a little bit further because it shows me they're passionate. It showed me they really care about the full project scope. Um, it just shows me that they're very knowledgeable of what they're doing. 
And then the other thing I would just say that I look for is attitude, positive can do attitude because skills can be taught, industry knowledge can be taught, but what can't be taught as easily is that attitude. And so um, if I see somebody on an interview that has a poor attitude or that was hard or, you know, says things to me that signal that they don't have that grit or they don't have that positive attitude, that those are deal breakers for me. Great advice. And certainly we keep those deal breakers in mind because we don't want to have any obstacles or challenges. And, and these are words of wisdom. Cassie, any closing remarks before we move to Leslie's career journey? I would just say for all of you on the call, you're already taking a big step just by being here. So keep taking these little steps. Keep documenting these, these little actions you can take every day to make that transition happen. And just know that you're already 10 steps ahead keep, keep going. You got it. Keep, keep going. Cheering everyone on. I love that. And that 30, 60, 90 day plan. I don't think that's bold at all. I think it shows that you're committed. That's the grit that companies are looking for. How you differentiate yourself from that, from the other candidates in a very large pool and a challenging job market. Cassie, your story has been riveting. Thank you so much for sharing it. Let me turn to um, the next slide and introduce our second career journey speaker, Leslie Petrie. Leslie is also my WCS career development board partner. She oversees our mentorship program, has gobs of experience in the corporate sector, in the technology sector, and we're gonna hear from her. Also, she's run the mentorship program this year for us and has been an extraordinary help in WCS career development. So we have double the pleasure of welcoming Leslie to um, the conversation and Next slide, let's have what Leslie take us through her career journey. Thank you so much, Pam. I'm so excited to be here speaking with all of you today. As Pam mentioned, I'm playing a dual role as a board member of WCS and mentorship program lead, but also as somebody that's been knee deep in this space, actually twice in my career. So I wanted to just walk you through some of the decisions that I've made throughout my career, because like Cassie mentioned, sometimes your career is a straight line, but for many of us, it is a jagged zigzag line um, that we take. And sometimes those decisions are very intentional. So one thing that I wanted to stress as I go through this is that every role that I've taken on, um, I was intentional about whether I wanted to do it or not. It was what did I want at that specific point in time and what did I need in terms of career advancement or career skill set building? So um, to start, I started my career um, working internationally. It was something that I knew I wanted to do in my career, and I figured it would be really hard to do it once I um, was into my career 10 or 20 years. So I did it right out of college, and I was lucky enough to work for an international company. I was the office manager in a Tokyo office that had 72 offices worldwide, so I had a great opportunity to network across the globe to travel and it was in the executive recruiting space, um, an industry that I didn't know anything about, but was able to land a job and get that early on experience. But I knew I wanted to get back to my roots of California. So I was lucky enough to be able to transfer back to California. And I wanted to move into tech. And I wasn't exactly sure how to do it, but I spoke Japanese. And I understood the language. I understood the culture across Asia Pacific. So I leveraged that skill set to get into Replay TV, which was an early stage set top box provider. Think TiVo. It was the TiVo competitor back in the day. Clearly, it didn't survive. And um, as the company was transitioning and changing and getting sold, I leveraged my network and I was able to move into National Semiconductor. So I started the first half of my career in the hardware semiconductor space. I leveraged that Asia Pacific knowledge because they needed somebody to work with that region to help grow the business, but I didn't have an engineering background. So it, it uh, made me perk up my ears when Greg from Powen mentioned that they're hiring women and don't have to have an engineering background. But when I was at National Semiconductor, they, they really um, wanted that in terms of um, growth opportunities for people and I didn't have it. So although I was able to work in solar across hardware, software, and services, for me in wanting to move on to my next career challenge, not having that background was somewhat stifling. So I leveraged again my network to move into Hurrah Software, which was an energy and sustainability system of record provider. 
So if you notice a common theme, it's being intentional about what I want and it's also about leveraging my network. So several of these roles, at least half throughout my career have come through me asking for help. And that is um, one thing that I think is hard for us generally as women is to be very bold and to be very direct and to ask for help. And so I had to ask for help throughout my career because like most of you, I've been upsized, I've been downsized, I've been laid off, we've been acquired. And so all of that means you have to be resilient. And I've been told no many times. And so getting back up, keep trying and getting to a position that you're going to be comfortable with and happy with. So as I transitioned into Hurrah Software, I thought it was going to be the greatest job, an early stage startup and um, leveraged my network to, to take on this new role as a director of um, global field marketing. And within four weeks, they let go of my VP of marketing. So I took over that role. Within another month or two, they let go of the VP of sales. So I took on that role. And so one other thing I wanted to leave you with is to just say yes. Be flexible, you will figure it out, but be open to trying anything. Had I ever done sales? No. Was it thrown into my lap? Yes. Why was it thrown into my lap? Because we happened to be expanding into Japan. And again, I knew the language and I knew the culture. So I happened to be the right fit for that role. But I came into the company thinking I was just going to do marketing. So being open to all of those changes and challenges that come your way. Um, I was at Hurrah for just about a year, and this was clean tech 1.0, when there was not a lot of investment in the space. So I was at this early stage startup that clearly was not going to survive, and they were positioning it to get acquired. So I actually was um, was contacted by a recruiter to get into to aggregate knowledge, which is the next place that I transitioned. And I have these three companies listed together because when I think about skill set building, I went from product marketing to field marketing to these next roles expanded me into everything marketing from solutions to industry to strategic. So I was able to leverage a SaaS background to get into these different companies. But as you can see, one was a startup and it got acquired. The next one was a billion dollar company that got acquired. Then I moved into Meta because of my network again. Um, that got me into um, startup businesses within a billion dollar company. And so while some of these changes were intentional in terms of skill set building and wanting to expand my purview, some happen without you even knowing, right? Like getting acquired. And it's not always a choice. It's not always fun. You're kind of thrust into a new organization. And so being resilient to kind of take that on or identify if it's not the right fit making that conscious decision to move to something that is going to be a better fit, which takes me to where I am today, doing marketing consulting. So I've spent time at startups, spent time at startup businesses within the large organizations and was downsized from Meta back in 2022. So after the shock wears off, then it's really taking a step back and to think about what do you want to do next? And I knew I wanted to get back into climate now that we're in climate 2.0 and there is a ton of investment in the space. So leveraging that experience I had from a decade ago to get back into climate, but doing it for myself. So making that conscious decision that if I want to be of service to this industry and I work for one company, I'm being of service to them. But if I'm consulting, I can be of service to many different companies. And that is very rewarding for me and self-satisfying. So also thinking about your career journey in terms of not only what are you going to give to the company, but what are you going to get out of it? Is it going to align with your goals, with your journey, and with your passions? So if I leave you with three things uh, through my journey, it's be intentional, it's have resilience, and it's say yes. Super. Leslie, you're talking about similar things to Cassie around the gray area, and that say yes moment is the flexibility, it's a growth mindset, it's the responsiveness to the current situation, and it's also about risk-taking. It's about continuing to learn and also being curious and being in the right place at the right time. And the agility by which both of you adapted and continue to move your careers along this journey. And yes, success is never a straight line. It's messy. It doesn't go the way we want to sometimes, 
but that continued um, grit and the commitment to do the right thing and protect the earth and contribute to the world's challenges. Just fantastic. So, um, Leslie, you've been downsized a time or two. How have you managed through that shock and uncertainty? So, well, one, I will empathize with anybody who is on the call who has gone through it because I know it is not fun and it's not easy and you need to take the time to get yourself in the right headspace to figure out what it truly is that you want to do next. Because I've had that knee jerk reaction of, I just need to find a job. I just need to pay my bills. And well, that, that's great. But sometimes you aren't going to show up well, as we, you know, Cassie talked about in terms of interviewing, you won't show up well if you're in that space. So giving yourself some grace and time to figure out what it is that you want to do next. The next is to reset your expectations. So what type of company do you want to work for? What type of role are you looking uh, looking for? Resetting your wants and your needs. And the last piece is leveraging your network. To not be shy. One of my, um, I, I mentioned National Semiconductor. I was actually there twice. And um, the second time I went back, I had to leverage my network. And here I felt I'm not sure what the right word is. I felt uneasy to reach out to my network, a VP who was still at the company that I had worked for previously because I hadn't been in touch for a few years. And of course, as a woman, it's like, well, you know, if I reach out, he's just going to think I want something. It seems weird. I'm not comfortable. And I finally was like, I just, I need a position and I'm really interested in getting into solar and he, that's under his purview. Let me reach out. And the response I got was amazing. It was one of those responses of Leslie, I haven't heard from you in such a long time. I can't believe that you reached out. What are you doing now and how can I help you? So, you know, we we sit and we agonize around making those decisions and how is it going to go? And, you know, I just want to give everybody the confidence that you can reach out. You can do it. It doesn't matter if you're asking for something. You always have something you can give as well. And so I would also encourage you to approach it that way, is that if you're asking for something, but also being open to giving. Um, one other thing I wanted to mention around um, interviewing, and Cassie had mentioned the problem solving um, one of the things that I've done in um, interviewing and coaching those who are interviewing is to think about your um, past experiences with a, what we call a star, the situation, the task, the action, and the result. So it's a very clear way for you to tell a succinct story that gets you to give some idea of what the situation was. Here were the decisions that I had to make, the actions I took, and the results that came out of it. So while you might not have those specific to climate, those challenges are specific to any company um, that you might be talking to. So that's just one thought I had as um, we were going through kind of ways that you might think about um, preparing for interviews. Some key points there about women always hesitating to ask for help, that imposter syndrome where we've rewritten the story, you have to get outside of our head, stop the negative self-talk, and make sure that we have stories that are relevant and important and utilize and maximize our transferable skills. Leslie, thank you so much for sharing your career journey and to Cassie as well. Let me to, uh, allow me to engage um, for the next slide is a breakout session. We're gonna do a six minute breakout session. We're putting, out, putting you all into pairs in breakout rooms. And if we move to the next slide, what I'd like to have you do, here's the instructions. These are also in your hands out is to sort of start your networking with a conversation to talk about your career transition journey. In pairs, using the handout, you've got a six step process, read the process, tell your story, where are you? And you're gonna tell your story to your breakout partner. You're gonna have three minutes each person in pairs. And I would like you to just think about what the stories that you heard the speakers tell, where you are, what you're missing, what you need to, to bake in given the lessons that you've learned and how you're gonna use transferable skills and the imposter syndrome and avoid that. So allow me to invite our breakout coordinator to push po people into breakouts for six minute breakout. Allow mm -hmm. me to um, give the brief call to action as we close mm -hmm. out. I, I would invite a couple of people, if you wanna type in the chat window, how your experience was in the breakout, um, observations, tell us where you are in the six step process. I'll just take one or two quick comments 
What did you learn about where you are in your transition journey? Who'd like to open their mic? Let's take two comments and then we'll move into the final segment, which is my interview and fireside chat with Renee Johnstone. So who'd like to share their thoughts about their breakout? Hi, I can go. Sure. If that's okay. Hi yeah. everyone, I'm I'm Madhu. Um, and I, um, uh, I'm in the HR space and I work with Airbnb currently looking to transition into climate. Um, we, uh, didn't get the link to the handout. We sort of remembered what you said. So we sort of, you know, went away with that, but if, uh, the handouts will be shared with us later, that will be super helpful. Uh, I think in our breakout group, I was with Nicole and Elora and, um, we spoke about, uh, you know, two of us are definitely a little earlier in terms of transitioning to climate, but um, it sounded like Elora was already is already in the um, climate space. And what I personally learned was there's also a transition that you can do even within the climate space. So you will still be in the sustainability space, but even within the sustainability space, you're wanting to move somewhere. You're doing business development, but you want to get into supply chain. So there is a wide um spectrum of transition it's either transitioning completely into climate from a completely new industry or transitioning just within the climate space so uh we did uh, speak about each of our journeys and where we are in in our climate space and uh uh by the time we could share our stories and what we are wanting to do in climate the time was up but it was good to connect and sort of understand where each of us were in our climate transition journey yeah, thanks for sharing. And certainly those are those functional expertise. Those are foundational to come into the space of climate because those skills and experience are needed and applying a layer of, of green or sustainability to your career. Madhu, thanks for sharing. I see Alexandra's hand is up, go ahead. Open your mic, please. All right, and I'll ask Denise, please pop the Hi. hand the chat again, Denise, oh. to get that chat, the uh, hands out for everyone. They were missing it. Go ahead, Alex. I'm sorry about that. I was on mute. Um, I just wanted to share a, a quick insight that Candace Young gave me. That's who I met with. And Candace works for the Department of Energy. And she had mentioned one place to start or one place uh, to add to your target list is to look at where the DOE is investing. Um, I was sharing with her that my focus is on electrification, including lithium ion batteries and charging. And so her suggestion is to take a look at where those investments are because they're likely to be hiring. Um, and so that I thought that was a, such a great idea that I wanted to make sure everyone else knew about it too. Yeah, and that's fantastic because when we when I wrote the description, there's a DOE report link, and I don't know if the link translated to WCS's description about this event, but you know, there's you know of the three hundred thousand jobs, you know, half of them being filled for by women in the energy workforce, and that's a 2022 report. So continuing to monitor DOE is a brilliant idea. Mm -hmm. You heard Powen Energy is hiring; they're going to hire two hundred people in the next in the next year or year and a half. So reach out to Greg Rossi or look at the Powen uh, Energy website see if there's job opportunities there that fit your area of expertise. So all of these are great. It's that curiosity and the mindset. Thanks for sharing, Alexandra. Um, yes, I will you're take welcome. one more. I, was, we, I, I want to leave plenty of time for Renee because we still have one more speaker before our live Q&A challenges. So Alexandra, would you please go? And then we're going to move forward. Sure. Um, uh, sorry, I joined late and my my laptop crashed, so I couldn't join the break room. But I quickly wanted to share. Uh, I spent I two years back is when I did my transition. I spent sixteen years in oil and gas, uh, doing the hands on operations work, and two years back completely flipped over the sides, or I would say went the other side of the table and joined the EV charging um, where I'm right now. And I think what my experience has been in in summary. Uh, do you, it took me almost six months to go through that journey uh, when I was trying to figure out where what were those transferable transferable skills that I could use from what I had done in past. And I got all sort of 
feedbacks back, like some of the hiring um, people were right out, like, you know, you come from oil and gas, sorry, you can't, we don't see how you can contribute. But in the end, you know, throughout that exercise, I managed to find the, like, you know, where I am right now. And it's been fantastic journey trying to find my foot in the, in the, um, in, in the, in this industry. So, yeah. And, and, you know, that's, so first of all, the session's being recorded. So make sure that you, WCS will send it out afterwards to all the registrants. So you can catch up with the um, recording after today. There's also a handout in the chat. Be, be sure to download that has some of the key slides. And oil and gas, guess what? They're going into the renewable energy. You look at Shell, they have a renewable energy division now. You've got BP Gas that was, you know, that acquired a startup renewable energy so there's de definitely the space where they're realizing the the future of fossil fuels is limited and that they need to be able to address that. I bet you can go to those major oil and gas companies right now and that they're looking for someone that understands both. Perfect opportunity for you to segue. I'm grateful for your comments. I hope you enjoyed the journey. Please put your contact information in the chat, follow up with each other, link in and network with each other. But I do want to introduce Renee Johnstone. She and I are going to have a great fireside chat, and then we're going to open the floor for live Q&A challenges from the audience. So this is our last speaker segment. Renee has deep experience talking about employer hiring trends. She is going to be talking about job search and transferable, transferable skills. She is a strategic national accounts director with Interpro Staffing and Recruiting Firm, which is a woman-owned business. I just love that. Her depth and experience is analyzing market trends and leveraging industry expertise to strategically position the company for this, for this incredible growth. She is a relationship builder on the candidate and the employer side and brings the two together brilliantly as a connector. Allow me to introduce and welcome Renee to the fireside chat. Next slide. I have four questions that I'm going to interview Renee about. So the first one is, what's the employer mindset during the hiring process, especially in this challenging job market? So we're getting behind this, the curtain, right? And the black box of what is going on with the employer mindset in the hiring process. Renee, give us your best thoughts. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so glad to be here. So just as you want to find the best employer, employers like you want the best candidate for their positions. One of my clients recently mentioned that applicants are up um, on average of 15%. The available candidate pool has increased in all areas, and you have to try a little bit harder to stand out amongst applicants. Don't let that dissuade you. Many applicants apply to positions that they are not qualified for. Men, for example, will apply to a position if they fit 60% of the requirements, whereas women don't apply unless they meet nearly 100%. Today's managers and leaders are looking for results-orientated resumes. Be sure to effectively translate your accomplishments as they relate to the position you're applying for. For example, you may wanna say implemented X, which resulted in a cost savings of Y, or you might wanna discuss something you automated, state automated X process, which led to a reduction in Y amount of time. During my conversations with hiring leaders, just wanna note they're in IT, they're in finance, they're in the creative space across many different verticals. We always discuss the reactive versus proactive employees, but this also applies to your career search. Reactive being applying to open positions you see on LinkedIn or job boards, whereas proactive is in cre creating that target list of companies that you would love to work for. The latter gives you a sense of control in an otherwise difficult market where you might feel easily frustrated. Taking back some of that control and utilizing some or all of the tips you heard today can help you build your confidence and ultimately find the perfect role for you. Now, I'm going to share some, some information that has been told to me over the 12 years that I've been. So I'm just a messenger um, with resumes. Managers have told me, many managers have told me that if a resume is more than three pages long, they're just going to throw it out. They don't have time to read that. So be very intentional about what you're putting on your resume and, you know, look at each job description and all the information you can find and tailor that resume. 
Storytelling ability, we heard a little bit about that earlier. It's key when framing your answers during an interview. I advise all of my candidates before their interview to create an outline. You don't want it to be a script, you just want it to be an outline of key points. So, you know, it might be that you have something you're most proud of. You want to frame that and just have a couple key points, maybe a solution you came up with. Just have a, a small outline for yourself. And always remember that you're interviewing the company just as much as they're interviewing you. Uh, with this in mind, countless managers have told me that if an applicant doesn't have any questions, no matter how great the interview was, they're not going to move forward with the candidate. So always have some questions prepared, you know, at the end of that outline. And perhaps some of them are answered, but then others come up during that discussion and interview. So just be prepared to ask those questions. I also want to encourage you to practice. Practice interviewing with your partner, your friends, former peers. Practicing helps you fine tune your answers and your storytelling and the ability to make it a little more conversational. I also, which I mentioned earlier, advise candidates to choose projects or examples that they're most proud of or most excited about, because that tone in your voice, just it brings out the excitement. Managers want to hear that you're excited about the topic, you're excited about the industry, you're excited about what you do for a living. Um, and it's just so important to express that excitement. And don't forget the thank you notes. Thank you notes are so important. It could be between you and another person. And if you send that thank you note, that might just push you to that offer stage. So always be intentional about that thank you note too. And if there's several interviewers and, and you hit it off in, in one way differently than the other, reiterate that interest, reiterate what you found interesting about what that particular interviewer said. Amazing advice. Let's talk about the top transferable skills that hiring managers are asking you for when you search for candidates for them. So you heard about this earlier, but the number one skill that leaders request is problem solvers, individuals that come with that solution mindset. And I just want to point out that sometimes when we're in an interview, we go back to that imposter syndrome thinking, you know, this doesn't really relate. This isn't important. That doesn't matter. What is, what is important to them is that you demonstrate that you solve problems, that you found a problem, you came up with that solution. So again, this goes back to developing that script, developing your storytelling ability around how you've solved problems. And if you've done a few, just have that on a script in front of you. And as after they've explained the uh, role to you, then you pick the one that's most relatable. The second most frequently requested skill, or actually they're really close, they're pretty much both in number one spot, is self-starters, right? Um, individuals who take the initiative. Very similar to problem solvers, you know, um, you don't wait around for someone to tell you what to do. You see that there's something that needs to be done, you take the initiative. Also, hiring managers love great communicators, communicators that can communicate up and down an organization with excellent presentation skills. So whether it's preparing a deck, whether it's pre presenting to senior stakeholders, whether it's speaking with developers, um, all of that is very important in demonstrating the communication skills. Something else that is really important and top of mind with leaders is that curious mind and lifelong learners, asking questions, being inquisitive. One way to demonstrate that you're a lifelong learner is to discuss the organizations that you belong to, the certifications you received, um, the organizations that you attend, like, like today, different workshops, the publications you read, any online trainings you've taken. We know that technology is evolving constantly. So just showing that you're staying on top and current is very important. Now, in an interview, you always want to discuss what you did, what your contributions were. However, it is important to demonstrate that you're a team player, that you're able to collaborate. Um, so definitely, when you're telling these stories, speak about, you know, say I, what I contributed, but certainly demonstrate that you're a able and willing and enjoy working on a team as well. Something that uh, a hiring leader I met with very recently mentioned was that her leader has a saying, 
everyone does the dishes. And I loved it because so many times I talk to managers and leaders is that they want people to demonstrate they can roll up their sleeves and perform the work and help where needed, right? You don't want someone to come in and say, hey, that's not my job. That's not what I'm here for. No, we're all here to help. We're all here to complete a position, complete a job together. So really being able to demonstrate that. And I just think that that really shows what they're looking for. And it's something I hear very often. Um, and I think, yeah, I think, I mean, there's, there, I could go on about this forever, but that those were some of the main ones I hear. I like do the dishes. And that's the, you know, also you're speaking about the gray area. And I love Cassie saying about the Jill of all trades and being able to do different things without saying, that's not my job because there is a lot of gray area in this world, in the world of work today and everyone's pitching in. So um, great advice. Tell us how candidates can leverage LinkedIn. I think you're like the queen of LinkedIn during the job, the career search. Give us some thoughts. So I love LinkedIn. I'm on LinkedIn all day and every day. I enjoy taking trainings or following leaders that post um, great tips on LinkedIn. So first and foremost, creating that list of top companies you want to work for, follow them on LinkedIn, follow their senior leadership, follow the person you would ultimately roll up to or have a dotted line to, their C-suite, their talent acquisition. And then engagement is your top priority. So engaging in that content is extremely important. I've heard from internal recruiters that if you engage in content in these companies you're interested in, you'll you'll show up further when they go out to search higher up on the algorithm. So engaging in the content that they post, um, engage in the content posted by companies you're interested in, engage with peers, engage with friends, make a commitment today to engage with individuals that you met today um, and engage on a regular basis. You're the marketing manager of your own brand. You tapping into your network. So when you go and look at, you know, ABC company on LinkedIn, you can see right there how many mutual connects that you have at that place. And, and don't be discouraged if you don't have any, just click to see how many second connects you have. And then look how you are, what your first connects are to that second connect um, and ask for that introduction. If you don't ask, the answer is always no, right? So don't rely on one or two people. You know, reach out to several. Make a commitment that, you know, today I'm going to focus on XYZ company. I'm going to look at my first connects, re-engage with them. I'm going to look at my second connects, ask for introductions. Make those introductions easy for people. Write it up yourself. Type it up. Shoot it over and say, hey, thank you so much, Pam. I, you know, I'd really love if you could introduce me to Cassie. You know, it would I'm really starting out my career search and I'm very interested in her in her firm and would love, love to meet her. Another another thing that I love and I've heard good stories is alumni support. You know, I love that LinkedIn will show you who is there from your alumni. Take that initiative to say hello to that person and ask them about their career journey and ask them if they could help you. Um, people inherently like to help others. So just asking for that help is super important and people are open to helping individuals. LinkedIn content, posting your own content. Now you don't have to be an author, right? I'm not saying you have to sit here and write articles, but you can share articles that relate to your current career, the career you're looking to getting into and being intentional about who your audience is, who your target companies are when you're sharing that, and just placing some of your own comments at the top and then placing the article within. The more tags, hashtags, pictures, the algorithm moves you up. Posting daily content is very important, but again, don't think, oh gosh, do I have to author all this content? No, you can just share relatable articles. And video, I hear, is is really the up one now that really pushes you up. But I, I haven't quite gotten into video yet. It's a tall order, but certainly yeah. the, the visibility is critical. And I would even go as far as linking in contacts in your function in the company that you want to work. And that just continues on the path of commenting and elevating their role, you know, who you're, who, their, the content that you're hearing. So give us a couple of sound bites on what advice you can offer for everyone here searching and transitioning to a new position or industry 
Then we're going to open it up for Q and A briefly, and then we're going to close the program at the um, at the next uh, you know at the next opportunity with Lael and myself. So give us some brief uh, pearls of wisdom here. So I changed careers in in my history, and this is something that I did. Um, I did my research. I attended career fairs. I attended conferences, seminars, events where my target companies or my target verticals were. Maybe they have a booth, perhaps they have, um, perhaps one of their employee, employees are speaking, presenting, meet people at that company, make sure to express your interest, ask for their business cards, gather information, ask who you should be reaching out to and connecting with at their company, um, gather their email, their phone number so you can follow up and don't forget to follow up, connect on LinkedIn, follow up by email, reach out to anyone that they recommended, when connecting on LinkedIn, make sure to mention where you met. This will jog their memory, but it'll also jog your memory in the future where maybe, you know, you're reaching back out and it's three months from now, or maybe you're looking to speak with them three years from now. You just want to remember how you met this particular person. Follow trade shows online. I think um, Cassie mentioned the Google Alerts. I love setting up Google Alerts for companies I'm interested in working with. Um, also setting up Google Alerts for conferences that relate that are relatable to the area, right? To the sustainability. Um, also attending the virtual events like today. This is an amazing event. Posting in the chat, introducing yourself. Perhaps you post your elevator pitch in there. Let the group know who you are, what you're looking for. Um, and teal. I love teal as a tracking tool that integrates into LinkedIn teal, like the color, um, it ties into your LinkedIn. It'll actually, there's a free version and a paid for version, but you're able to kind of see where you stand in, um, you know, teal will tell you these are the top skills and then, you know, look at your resume and give you some tips on that. Lastly, join women in clean tech. Um, you'll have access to the job board, the Slack channel, and many great professionals that would love to help you. And I am happy to help in any way I can. Feel free. I did put my LinkedIn in, um, connect with me. I think working with professionals in this space is, is very helpful when, when changing careers. Excellent advice, Renee. As always, your fireside chat is filled with Great information, great tips and suggestions, employer mindset and the hiring process, as well as to help everyone on this call in their transition. So allow me to ask the slide advance to the next slide. And we're opening it up for expert Q&A panel. Um, and then the, the next slide. So allow me to have you raise your hand. I see Stacy has a comment. Stacy, are you still with us? Um, because you're mentioning your challenge in the chat. Let's start there and see if, um, Stacey, you're still on the call. And we certainly- Is that me? Start... Yeah, okay, oh, excellent. Hi. So yeah, so tell us about your challenge um, and then we'll um, take other um, couple of other volunteers for their challenges. Go ahead, Stacey. Sure, thanks. Uh, hi, I'm Stassi, uh, it's nice to meet you all. I mentioned in the chat that I have a background in agriculture and supply chains. Um, and actually, Cassie, I think, did a great job of giving me some ideas of how to approach this. And since then, I think you all have sort of chimed in with other ideas to use. I sort of started with the job search approach of listing 15 people that I admire and think are doing interesting things, spoke with them all, asked them for introductions to more people, et cetera, et cetera. But I think a challenge that I continue to face is like, I just reach dead ends because my existing network is just, um, or feels removed from sort of clean tech sustainability and climate work. Uh, and so I was just curious to hear from others some additional approaches I could try, but already there's so many comments in here that have been really helpful. So I'm very grateful for that, but happy to hear anything else verbally okay. as well. Allow me to open up to our panel. Um, and I see raised hands. We'll have Arisha and Lauren next. Go ahead, any panelists um, offering some help for Stasi. We'll take one panelist comment. I mean, I think that you're you're doing a great great job. I mean, honestly, you're you're already thinking about what what you need to do you need to do next. Um, I guess my question is more specifically, where where do you feel most stuck? Is it really just more of a mindset shift 
for yourself or is it just the tactics? What, what, what is it that you, where you're feeling like most stuck? That's so funny. You sound like my coach. <laughs> She's like, what if you thought about it from an abundance mindset instead of a scarcity mindset? I definitely think that's part of it. Um, I feel like I just have existed in such a niche. Like I'm not, I don't have a background in marketing, for example, like I'm sort of a generalist. I do operations, but I've done this work for small social enterprises and very specific geographies. And so I, I think I tend to approach this by thinking like there's only a specific niche that I can fit into because like that's where I come from. So I definitely think there's an opportunity for me to at least um, have less of imposter syndrome and a little bit more faith and confidence that like I can have these transferable skills. And so this handout, for example, is also very helpful in sort of thinking about those transferable power skills and the ways in which I don't have to pigeonhole myself and like just look at these specific niches, but potentially uh, be open to a lot broader set of opportunity. Um, and then the other thing I think is like a lot about the way in which we approach networking situations, right? Like feeling comfortable and okay and valuable, like shaking someone's hand and saying like, hello, CEO of X, Y, or Z company, or hello, VP of marketing at X, Y, or Z company. Like I deserve to have this conversation with you. I think that's also what's very intimidating about entering into like a conference space or an expo or something like that. Um, because it can be very intimidating because I don't necessarily know what I'm offering and feel like I'm only asking for something, right? Well, I'll give you a secret is nobody knows everything. Nobody knows everything about you and you don't know everything about the other person. And so I think mm -hmm. if you approach every conversation is like, this is my opportunity to learn and this is a person to like learn about me as well, that natural curiosity will spark conversation. And it's not that you're, you know, less deserving of someone's time because of their title um, executives and every level of any organization should want to get out there and learn and hear from new people and mm -hmm. have you thought about this or what's happening there um, people don't get to a certain level in a company unless they are curious and are lifelong learners so mm -hmm. I think if you can approach that I'm here to learn they're here to learn and we have something to offer each other um, it might help you in those conversations Thanks, Sassy and, and Cassie. We've got five minutes and four hands raised, and we still have closing slides. Let's jump in with Arisha. Open your microphone. Let's be brief and see if, how we can help you. Go ahead. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Um, so I have a, uh, a a question about personal experiences. Um, I managed my dad's caregiving while I was working full time. You know, there were moments when caregivers canceled at the last minute, and not to say everything about all the emotional stuff that goes on with that. Can I bring this experience into my interview? Is it best left with like one-on-one -on -one networking type of conversations? I certainly don't want to evoke a sense of pity. I want to evoke a sense of strength. Thank you. Panelists, any thoughts? So I, my thing with, with bringing up personal experiences, you don't know who your audience is. And, you know, if you're working with someone like myself or an internal recruiter where you can gather information about that interviewer before and how that would sit with them, I, I feel that that is a great way to kind of guide you whether or not you would bring that up. Um, you know, this certainly shows that resilience piece. I, I'm going through something like that myself right now. I know talking to so many hiring managers, I might wait till after that, maybe that first round, you know, make that first round more about, you know, my career. And then perhaps the second round, you can talk about some of that resilience piece. It, it may you. also be, uh, you know, part of the, the, um, the job gap, right? The employment gap is, is filled with that time. So that might be a way to respond if they question yeah. like what you've been doing with your time. And so I would transit, you know, it, I agree with Renee, certainly leave it. To, if they don't ask, I wouldn't def definitely not offer it, but it may also be a way to help explain that gap. So we wish you luck. Um, that's such a common problem today, Arisha. Let's go to Lauren next. Oh, wait, we've got three minutes left. We're in a lot of trouble. I got three hands raised. Lauren, go ahead. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, uh, Arisha, I wanted to just mention that that is a relevant thing for me as well. And I'm really glad that you brought it up. So thanks for, for bringing that up. Um, my question is that I'm, I'm pivoting into climate tech, green tech, and trying to figure out where I belong. 
And, you know, like what, you know, is it, is it agriculture? Is it conservation? Is it energy? And I mostly am seeing energy. Like I mostly, that's where I see a lot of the jobs. I think that's where we're talking about a lot of energy today. Um, and I'm feeling a little bit like, hmm, if I want to pivot, I need to pivot into energy. D is that necessarily true? You know, are there other uh, um, uh, focuses out there that are really up and coming right now? Is it maybe the best idea to just pivot to energy and then go from there? That would be my question. Panelists. Any advice briefly? My brief advice would be keep your options open and make sure that you're looking across the whole industry. So that's, so you want to be, we talked about being a specialist versus being a generalist. I think right now you really have to think of yourself as a generalist and look across all of those sectors. One other thought is there are a lot of sectors to, to your point. So are there some specific, you know, three to four that um, spark your interest because you want to be passionate about what it is you're going to do. Most of them are investing. So one thing you can look at is, are they pre-seed, seed, series A, B, C? And um, is there a specific sweet spot in terms of size of company and funding um, of where you want to go? That's one other um, lens that you might look at for targeting some of your companies. Well, that's a great um, a great start. We're, we are running out of time. Boy, I think we could talk for another half hour, ladies. Um, we've got to come to the end of our workshop at this time. We thank you so much. Feel free to reach out and link in the panelists and myself to continue the conversation and support you. If your question wasn't answered today, we're glad to support you afterwards. But we do want to thank you for attending the Jumpstarting Your Sustainability Career with transferable, transferable Skills. I want to thank each and one, every one of you for your active participation, your enthusiasm. It's inspiring to see you driving toward this change. We thank our speakers, Cassie, Leslie, and Renee and our sponsors, Greg and Allison, and Lael, our host, and the entire production team for our time together. So let's make that tidal wave of change. The world is counting on us. Thank you. Let me turn it back to Lael for final remarks. Okay, I am going to speed through this. Um, I was going to review the upcoming events, but you can check our events uh, page for that. So next slide, please. Um, the next two PDW workshops, this was a PDW workshop. The next two are in August and October. Again, you can check our events website for that. Um, next slide. And then if you please check out our merchandise. Um, if you go to that QR code and, and purchase today, you can use a 15% off coupon WCS 15 off. Um, you get 15% off anything you purchase. And next slide, I think that might be it. Yeah, basically, thank you to today's speakers. And also, thank you so much to our volunteers who actually made this possible and made it happen. Um, so thank you to everybody that's listed on that slide. You've all been amazing. And thank you, everyone who attended today. Fantastic day. And keep in mind, we have social media. So final slide has social media connects. Follow us on Slack and the other, uh, and the other um, social media page. Thank you all. Thanks, everyone. Bye.